My name's Andrew Markham. Um, hopefully everybody knows me who's coming in here or has seen me before. I'm um, one of the directors at SDS. I head up the consultancy side and, and I've put together these webinars um, with, with industry knowledge. Um, and sometimes we kind of dovetail that with hints and tips to help you along the journey. We're here to help share knowledge and get best practice. So there's no better way than kind of getting best practice than Paul Christensen, who's been with STS longer than I have, which is over 14 years, and knows our product inside out, and is here today to kind of go on. Now, Paul does go on a lot. He's got a lot of knowledge. Um, so we've got to kind of bring him into a, uh, a tight regime of, of getting this through today. So um, we want questions. We want your input. It's trying to be interactive as best as possible. Um, we can so please um, email your or, or text your um, uh, questions and if we don't get through it in this session we will answer it okay so that's my commitment we will email you back with an answer in some form what how many other questions you have so before we get started John is a, one of our senior kind of consultants at SDS um, and he does a lot of the services that we provide mainly is swamped at the moment with the assumptions reports, the development assumption reports, which is a valuable service that we offer in the consultancy side. Uh, and he's very busy with that. Just say hello, John. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Uh, a wealth of knowledge across the sector. Um, and, and Paul, do you want to say hello? Uh, unless he's disappeared again. Um, morning. I'm still here. I'm just trying to sort out an issue. Okay, great. Okay, that's good. Um, so, right, John, over to you. Let's get started. Hints and tips. Um, I think we're starting with ProVal, but um, let's have a little intro from, from yourself. Okay, so um, I just want to start the slideshow from the beginning. Um, I won't overwhelm you with too much PowerPoint. I just want to give you a heads up on the journey that we're going on. Um, and we're quite tight for time was basically the bottom line. But I wanted to show you what destinations along the way, what might be of interest to people. So um, here we go. I'll just show you, hopefully, the items we're going to think about and talk about. One is a headline article that I think is really important to share. And it's kind of buried away in the latest guidance. But what is uh, available in terms of social rent inflation from March 2025 onwards we found some guidance from the regulator stroke government in terms of what, what rent inflation settings we can set from March 2025 onwards, which will improve everybody's um, appraisals if it's correct. Um, a profile tip we want to look at is basically we're going to be demonstrating, Paul's going to be demonstrating anything we show you on the single cash flow, which is what we've moved to from the dual cash flow in Proval. And a lot of people are asking us what are the basic differences between the two? So if you haven't upgraded yet, um, that might be the discussion point of what's the differences between the single and dual cash flow. Um, something we see uh, regularly and get questioned regularly with customers is in my summary window on my appraisal on my project, the loan's repaid, but I I've still got a negative NPV. Why is that? And there's a simple answer to that, um, which we'll cover. And it's kind of linked to the next tip, which is about what's the relationship between my interest or loan rate in the long term and my NPV discount rate. You can tell Paul and I are rather anoraki on the detail. Yeah. If somebody just dropped into this webinar without using ProVal or appraisals, they'd wonder what on earth we were talking about. So it's going to be rather technical, but hopefully you're here because you actually want to know that. Um, ProVal tip. Do we all look at unit NPV performance in section I? Yeah. Uh, every time I show it to people, they're excited about it and say they didn't know it was there. So we're putting that forward as a tip. So you can actually see the performance of individual units and whether you should improve your mix or not. Um, a little tip from me as a practical user. How about the idea of putting plot numbers in your unit description at the head of each column? If you're doing 106 deals with a house builder, um, they're notorious for changing the tenures on the plots. So how do you keep a track of which column relates to which tenure? 
you can put plot numbers in the unit description. Um, something, a proval trap that both Paul and I have experienced when people are using life cycle costs as a major repair allowance. And we just want to give a heads up on that. I'm not going to give too, I'm not going to talk too much about that because we're tight for time. Um, and Paul's come up with this tip, which is looking at the affordable loan on rent, and you can see it per unit, and then it can appear as per tenure in your summary window. This might excite some of the finance directors that you can actually see what a loan can be afforded by each tenure or even each unit. Um, we are going to talk about SQL, and there's a big reveal um, towards the end of SQL. We're going to take that tip from Paul into SQL that I could actually see the affordable loan on rent as a property attribute. That might be quite detailed whether we want to go there. Uh, we could drop that if we're tight for time. Um, Personalised quick reports. Um, as a user, I've, I am surprised people don't use these enough. When you're asked for repeat items from, from SQL, such as sales data, you can actually personalize a quick report in property and say, here's the same information you keep asking me for sales team. Um, here's a quick report at the click of a button. It will gather the attributes on that quick report and you can call it repeat items for the sales team or whatever, it, or whatever you want to do. Um, Paul's produced a lovely contractors and consultants report in SQL. So you can run a report and find out how much you've paid Bob the Builder either across a range of projects or how much has each project um, spent with a range of contractors and consultants. So there's two ways this report can actually be used. Um, and this is the big reveal. Paul's been working hard on a Homes England IMS report. Hooray, say the project managers. You can, we're, what we're focusing on is grabbing the key data, I emphasize the key data, for IMS from SQL. So that manual interface of where's the data for IMS and the manual inputting on an Excel sheet, we're trying to work towards uh, an automated solution where we grab the majority of the data. And personally, I think it's quite effective and could save a lot of people a lot of time. And then finally, there is the ability to change the, se the seasonal appearance of your SQL. And not many people are aware of this. It's just a little funny at the end of our, um, our journey, but uh, you can actually put Valentine's Day background on, the, on your SQL <laughs> as appropriate. Um, but um, we're hoping for questions and answers. However, I'll give you a healthy warning um, that we've got 13 items, unless we drop some of them. And by the time now we've got 50 minutes, so that's about four minutes per item. Um, are we going to get through them at four minutes an item? We've got about 200 attendees registered for this webinar. Uh, if everybody starts asking questions, we're going to get a roadblock, I think. Um, some questions could open a can of worms discussion. And if we're not careful, uh, that can of worms could go down a rabbit hole at any point. Um, so just be careful what you ask for. Um, we're trying to help you with, with tips and tricks in terms of using Proval. I've shown you some of the destinations we're going to travel over. Um, as Andrew has said, if you have a, a burning question, we will respond to it after the webinar as well. It may be that we actually have to extend this into a second webinar. I don't know. It depends how, how it goes. Um, the first point, if I, if I press on because we're tight for time, yeah, what's this all about? Yeah, what's this yeah. all about social rent inflation? Well, um, we had the summer last year where we had that consultation from uh, the government saying we might um, put a, a rent ceiling uh, for 23, 24 on social rents, three, five or seven percent. And it might be for one year, it might be for two years. Um, in the autumn statement, the government stood up in Parliament and said uh, there's going to be a seven percent rent ceiling for existing residents. Uh, the devil is in the detail because there are some um, tenures that are exempt from that rent ceiling. And for, ex for new tenancies, you could go to CPI plus 1%, which in effect is 11.1%. So for new tenancies or relets, 
is not subject to the 7% rent ceiling. And then the NHF stepped in and said, oh, if we're having 7% rent ceiling on social rent, let's have it on, on um, shared ownership. Uh, and we think most of our, um, our colleagues will actually stick with a 7% rent, a rent ceiling on shared ownership. Not everybody has. Um, Paul and I have come across shared ownership who've received uh, rent increases above uh, around 13%. Um, which is rather extraordinary in the in these times. And if you look in the capital funding guide, rent inflation on shared ownership can be based on RPI plus a half. Anyway, I can get very anoraki. I've gone down a rabbit hole there. But basically, um, 14th of December last year, um, the government polished and uh, published an update or even polished a polished update to uh, policy statement on rents. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and that guidance, if you take time to read it like I do, um, within it, I've highlighted it, it actually goes through how you set a formula rent. And it had the note in there that formula rents will increase by CPI plus one percentage point each year from 2024, 25 onwards. And we've interpreted that, that, that long standing query, how do I set my um, social rent after March 2025 because we've got no government guidance here whether they meant to do it or not there's an indication that beyond March 2025 it could be CPI plus one and that could have a big impact on a lot of appraisals over years one to a hundred uh, in section G and yeah I'm realizing I'm sounding like a real anorak in terms of detail um, <laughs> So I do apologise, um, but um, what I'll do is I'll actually stop sharing and we'll go over to the points that um, that Paul can actually describe to us. So hopefully I've covered the first item in our 13 items. The second one is with Paul, what are the differences? And we are demonstrating single cash flow and a lot of users may still be on uh, the dual cash flow, the two cash flow. Now, speaking as a user, put my hand up as a user, I still see a development period and I still see a management period when I look at this new single cash flow. Um, to my mind, there isn't a lot of difference other than um, you could start your net present journey, net present value journey, from a milestone other than first handover. So in the old version of dual cash flow, you pretty much started your net present value journey from first handover. Whereas the single cash flow in effect says, if you really, really want to, you could start your net present value journey from cash flow start or any other milestone that you may choose to. I think that we've been encouraged to do this by financial people commenting uh, on, on ProVal in the past and saying, could we do a net present value journey from cash flow start or wherever we choose? Now, um, I don't know if Paul wants to come in and turn his microphone on and actually give us some insight. The other big difference as a user I've seen to dual cash flow uh, from dual cash flow to single cash flow is the spread buttons. So if you remember spreading your payments was in section D all about the land, the build, the fees. Now those spread buttons pop up. Uh, it was in section D. They now pop up around where those lumps of money are. So they're adjacent to where you're putting in your lumps of money in the appraisal. They are not in section D. And then finally, um, there is the ability um, to look at the cash flow right down to a monthly basis if you really, really want to. Um, other, it does expand rather to large, a rather large screen. Um, but in the background of the single cash flow, I'm told by the IT guys at SDS, it's actually doing a daily, believe it or not, a daily NPV calculation on each unit type. It then summarizes that as a, as a monthly uh, NPV performance. And then that 
gets built into an, a, a quarterly and then an annual uh, NPV performance and then over the life of the NPV period. I'm realizing I'm using a lot of technical terms here, but hopefully um, you're on the journey with me and I'll get Paul to actually describe maybe some of the features he feels um, describe the differences between the dual cash flow and moving to the single cash flow. Over to you, Paul. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for that, John. Uh, follow you and you is going to be quite difficult to try and remember everything you mentioned, but there you go. <laughs> um prime function between the dual cash flow and the long term and the single cash flow is obviously it's in the in the words the dual cash flow had a, a development cash flow and then the long-term cash flow started from when the first handover now in the dual cash flow version the long-term cash flow was 100 years the fact that we have a single cash flow now in actual fact means i've only got 100 years so if you've got five years of development the long-term element part of it, in other words, after handover, is only going to be 95 years long. So just bear that in mind. So I'll come back to you on that. From a setting point of view, from a usability point of view, things are pretty much where they used to be, apart from D and J. In the dual cash flow version, section D was the development cash flow, section J was the long-term cash flow. You'll find in the single cash flow model, they are identical. We didn't bother to remove one of the letters because it just seemed a bit silly. So if you look in D and look in J, you're actually looking at exactly the same cash flow because there is only one. What um, John was intimating is you can move things around. So as an organization, you might choose. I'm just going to close the summary down for a moment. You might choose when you put your long term borrowings in uh, of 5%, which is what I'm using in mine, uh, my cross subsidies in the same place. But there's a new column right at the very end. The column allows you to decide when that long-term cash flow calculation for the loan will start. It is fixed for the overdraft method. The overdraft method says, I'm going to use all income to pay for the project. How long will it take? So therefore, automatically, I'm only going to get income at first handover. That's the earliest I can get it. So if you use the overdraft method, there is no need for you to make any changes than what you've got now. So a blank means first handover, and it will be automatically blank. If you are using the annuity method, you can move the start of that annuity. Say, for instance, you were using a 50-year annuity. You can move the starting point of that annuity up and down the timeline by milestone. So you could, in extra fact, and we've had one or two unusual requests they wanted to start the borrowing payments five years after the cash flow or the long-term cash flow started effectively having a holiday i don't really want to get into that on this conversation but if you are using anything other than the overdraft you can move the start point uh, of that cash flow uh, of the loan repayment up and down the timeline if that's what you want to call it most organizations use the overdraft method, so you can just leave this blank. If you haven't, if you've set it to first handover, that's fine. If you set it to cash flow, it's going to ignore it. It will still only be at first handover because that's the earliest I can get income. I think we, we could do a whole webinar on uh, the differences between the dual cash flow and the single cash flow. Yeah. But it's just giving a heads up to users, uh, basically about the basic themes of a single cash flow. And maybe they can get in touch with us if they've got queries um, about uh, what's what's occurring with it, and we can spend a bit more time on it. I know Ben in the support team has actually produced uh, some guidance documents on the differences between the two. Um, we think it's more detailed in terms of its NPV calculation, and we also think it um, aligns with how finance people look at projects that potentially they could look at the net present value right from cash flow start. And I think you mentioned, to me, you mentioned to me, Paul, the likes of persimmon stroke house builders will actually um, benefit that they could look at IRR, internal rate of return, in a more practical way that they could actually start calculating their, their return rates from cash flow start, i.e. the development cash flow period, or the development period, sorry, all that expenditure up until the point of sale 
Whereas with the dual cash flow, we were stuck with a, a point of analysis um, originally at for, from first handover rather than cash flow start. I put that rather bluntly. And, no, that's um, fine, John. It's probably easier for me to explain it on here. So in section, so the, the letters are pretty much the same as they were before. So they, there's nothing new there. From this point of view, we're talking about MPV um, start positions. You on on the MPV of the individual unit types or the uh, tenure or column types, I can then calculate the MPV from a particular place. Obviously, if we're, where we've got rented units, you're going to do it from unit handover because I'm not really interested in uh, um, MPV is a measure of income, so I'm not going to get the income until I hand them over. However, on an outright sale unit, you quite often would want to know, actually, I want to incorporate the build costs on the IRR included. So you could, in actual fact, say, well, and this is just a choice thing. I want to run the MPB for the, uh, which, would, would, which would include the IRR calculation on the outright sale from the hand of the, from uh, cash flow start. Uh, or you might, in actual fact, say, I'm going to do it from the start on site because that's during the build frame so you can set these so there's an extra row in here which you don't have in the dual cash flow so you get the, the, as you mentioned yesterday john the biggest problem with flexibility comes decisions so sometimes you don't want to have the decisions but this is down to obviously the administration team they can lock the questions so that they can be locked so that they can't be altered so it depends on the organization so, so I, I think we need to move on from this one to, to the to. next one but 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 basically, um, single cash flow gives a lot more variety in terms of looking at NPV performance and IRR performance, basically. And we've also um, put the spread buttons adjacent to the lump sums of money. And we've got, yeah, that, that's broadly speaking where we're at. It, it's to me, it wasn't that difficult to migrate over from dual cash flow to single cash flow. The, the important the, let me jump in there the important thing is there's going to be a slight difference okay on the two isn't there so and balls and people don't like differences so that's that that is the point of either testing it in a different environment a test environment if you can do get comfortable with that and then start any new appraisal in the single cash flow but, if, 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 but paul guys we, we have to move we have to i'm move. moving on so yeah. if you if you if you on that differences, uh, John uh, Andrew, yeah. if you set the single cash flow to behave the same way that the develop the dual cash flow does, you're going to get the same answers. Good. The MPV might be slightly improved because it's more accurate and it's yeah. does it daily rather than monthly, but apart from that, it's pretty much the same. Right. Okay. So um, from the, from the spend pattern point of view, when I put a cost in, I can determine how that cost is going to be done. Sorry. So yeah. my site surveys are going to be at 100% of cash flow start. So you literally need to, every time you put a cost in, you determine how that's going to happen. The only one that's different is if you set it to manual, you do have to go to section D and do it manually like you used to have to. It's yeah. not used very commonly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's move on to the next point, which I think if you open the summary window on this appraisal that, that we talked about yesterday, uh, if you open the summary window where we can actually see the results of the project, we were talking about um, a, a loan being repaid off uh, on, on the project, but still having a negative uh, MPV. Mm -hmm. Now, at the moment, we've, we've, we've got a demonstration scheme where we've got a positive MPV. So um, <laughs> no, I I, it's, it's the other one that we were looking at, John. Um, OK, all right. Or were we? What we were looking at is the NPV rates to the, compared to the loan rates. And this kind of links with the second point. Um, if we go to the start section of this appraisal and see what we're borrowing at. At 5%. Right, okay. Um, so if you just uh, evidence that to us, Paul, that the long-term loans are at 5%, okay. maybe slightly on the high side for a housing association, but they're all thereabouts. And then what we're gonna compare it with is actually the NPV discount rate in section A. 
And this comes on to the, the, the associated point of, look at that NPV discount rate, it's five and a half percent across the different 10 years. And this is a, a point that we've discussed with customers, where you've got core tenures like social rent, affordable rent, shared ownership, that are core to your business. Maybe the case with social rent, affordable rent, we call it general needs rent. If you've got a high housing waiting list for those tenures, um, why are you putting a half a percent on top of the borrowing rate for that discount rate? That half a percent difference between 5% loan rate and 5.5% discount rate is actually penalizing the NPV performance. Um, and if you've got a long waiting list, maybe a grant agreement with Hangs England, it's your core business. And also within the rent allowances of appraisal, you've actually got voids and bad debts allowance. What risk have you got that requires a half a percent on top of those core tenures? If Paul takes that um, down to the loan rate, and this is what happens when I'm discussing assumptions with people, um, we actually get a much higher NPV performance in the summary window. We've jumped up to nearly 340, well, 343 positive over 50 years. Um, 50 years is that a typical NPV discount period. Again, we could talk about that. If you've got a grant agreement with Homes England, the detail of that grant agreement says, if we give you grant, you must manage and maintain that home, manage and maintain it for a minimum of 60 years. And some boards in some providers are saying, well, I've, if I've got to manage and maintain it for, for 60 years, why don't I push my NPV discount period out accordingly? So if Paul actually changes that again, and again, he can do this because he's an administrator, some of these settings will be closed down. Um, we've pushed the NPV performance we could just select it on the core tenures. If you, you know, why have 60 years on outright sale? You shouldn't really. Why have it on it, it, shared There ownership? will be no income after it's paid or been sold. So yeah, it yeah. Be once it's sold, it's sold. Um, but you could actually have a different performance criteria for different tenures. We've got a slight risk margin on shared ownership. We've got a slight risk margin on outright sale of 5.5 discount rate. Um, so. If Paul just changes the shared ownership, perhaps back to 50 years, and we've got 60 years because we've got a grant agreement on the social rent and affordable rent. But we're just showing you, you can actually have different performance criteria for different tenures, either a different discount rate and a different discount period. Now, we've had some queries about my loans being repaid off, which is one of my key hurdle rates, but I'm still getting a negative NPV. Excuse me, I do apologize. Uh, I'm still getting an N a negative project NPV. Why is that? Well, one of the key issues is actually, is my discount rate close to or very different to my, N my NPV rate? Have you got too high a margin for risk on those core tenures? And therefore, there are two different journeys going on inside ProVal. One is the journey, when is the net rent gonna pay off the loan? And we show that by the loan repaid year. The other journey that's going on is, when does the net rent, um, plus any capital receipts I've got, pay off the opening loan without the interest involved? Yeah? And so NPV at first handover can be a different journey length of journey compared to paying off the loan especially if you're using an overdraft loan method this is all rather technical but do come back to us if you've got a different if you've got a, a positive loan repaid year but still got a negative npv project look at what we would advise you to do is look at your npv discount rate and npv discount period i think we've pretty much covered that one okay and linked to it in section I is actually the unit performance of NPV, yeah, or the NPV performance of units. And this is what we show to um, attendees when we actually do training or consultancy with them. 
and not many people actually bother to actually come into section I and drop down to the unit results and look at the NPV performance of each unit column. If, as Paul tips open the triangle for it, you can actually scroll down through it. And if you couldn't work it out from the positive and negative figures, we actually give you a net present value rank. So the best performing unit is actually um, the outright sale with a positive um, 219,000 uh, contribution. The next is shared ownership with a positive 120. And we can see that actually the worst performing unit is column A with minus 85,000 on that individual unit. But because we've got 10 of those same units, the NPV performance in the summary window of social rent is a lot larger. So in section I, you can look at the unit performance and then maybe if it's within your gift to design the scheme, you could actually change the mix because you've run an appraisal and looked at the NPV performance of the different units you're proposing in the mix. And obviously you need to go back to the planner and actually say, could I change this to that tenure or this size to that size? And you know, you've actually looked at the NPV performance of each column of unit type. Is there anything you want to add there, Paul? Uh, just that Andrew? you noticed then on the outright sale, there's a, no IRR shown. In my settings, I have a threshold for that. So if it's beyond a certain value, don't show it because it might be spurious. So I've, I've seen like 200% IRR because it's only taking the sale period and not actually taking the costs involved. So keep an eye on those milestones as well uh, for the MPV setting. Hence the reason why you can change it. Section D and section J are identical. There's one benefit of uh, or a couple of the small benefits. Obviously, we can drill down to the cash flow and you can say, actually, I've got quarters in here. I want to see what's happening in that particular month. Yeah. But also on top of that, the long term cash flow, you could say, actually, I want to look at the social rent only the long term cash flow for them. You could not do this in the dual cash flow version. What you saw was a, an amalgamated position, whereas here you can actually say, I want to see in the long term cash flow exactly what's happening. When am I going to get? And if I want to look at the net rent, uh, we also have an opportunity to look at cross subsidy. So if you're on an individual tenure and the cross subsidy is switched on, you can see where the cross subsidy is happening and how much you're getting or you're costing from a particular organization uh, tenure. I think that's it pretty much. Uh, Okay, Paul, Paul um, thanks for that. I'm just going to ask you a question on um, what you just said about unit um, information. So you, on your summary screen, has a affordable loan on rent. Can yes. you explain that? What, what... So in, in section um, I, uh, we can look, uh, it's in section F, I think. Yeah. At the yeah. bottom of the file, the value to loan ratios, there is a affordable loan on net rent. So in other words, we're looking at the net rent uh, over the time frame that the MPV has been set and what's the value of that rent and what loan can be afforded at the borrowing rate that you've set. So this is a criteria for IMS. They want to know what's the affordable loan on the net rent. Okay, so we just... and I've actually set it so that it comes out of my summary. So there are okay. some settings in the summary. You can add things to the summary section and I find it useful because I can uh, pick up on this. Uh, it, obviously, you're not going to get it on everything. It just looks a bit strange. You're not going to get anything on. But I've also got on here actual sales. Uh, and and I've also got MPV first handover. And I've got uh, on some of them, I've got MPV at a particular milestone. So in section I, in scheme results, so this is also new, I can set a, a custom milestone that I'd like the MPV to be shown at. And I can actually bring that out on the summary. So there are a few organizations they want to know. I want to know the MPV at first from first handover, but I would also like to know if I extrapolate that backwards through the development time frame, what would that MPV if I took it from cash flow start? So you can set it in your MPV and as a custom milestone. And I, I happen to have it set so that I can bring it out in my summary. Please you have do it, have it in the you like have it in the project if if you go up. Uh, on your yeah, summary window, Paul, yeah. you've actually put it in your appraisal summary there. Yeah. 
So the, as, a, as a user, it's almost like the appraisal summary window is my dashboard. When I'm driving the appraisal, those that's the speedometer and the mileometer, et cetera, and the NPVometer, yeah, um, as I'm driving my appraisal. And what we're saying is you could have a, a range of performance criteria in there that your organization may wish for. So, sorry, I'm just chipping in with my no, simple no, explanation. Fine. Yeah. Uh, lots of people don't realize that you can add things to the summary. You need to contact the support team if you need to know how to set it, please. It is an administrator function. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So that is, uh, let me just summarize. Are we, is that the tips that you've, you've covered? No, um, no not, not for ProVal. We haven't quite finished yet. Just okay. very quickly in section sure. A, yeah. um, putting in the plot numbers uh, in the dwelling description at the top. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm slightly different from John. I tend to put them down in other description, but they could go in the description at the top. So, yeah, you, what we're saying here is hang on, we've got a choice. You can add questions to different sections so you can customize ProVal in certain areas um, and to which will help you for the information gathering. Yeah. Well, what, what I simply do, Andrew, is I go where dwelling description is. So, if Paul goes up to the top of that column, I would put P one to ten okay yeah or and you get more space and that then if i was doing a 106 deal i know that those 10 units are plots one to ten yes yeah, and then if if the builder comes back and says actually i'm moving the plots around i just change those figures so it's a very blunt and easy way for me to do it and keep okay. track of right. it. Yeah. so going back on your questions here of you said here the other part that you were going to talk about was life cycle costings and the trap yes okay right so that's our last part and then we we you know please ask any questions we've got no questions at the moment so i think you scared everyone off john um really or maybe uh, maybe it's too technical i don't know it, um, it may, life, it, life cycle costings are used to some degree they can be problematic so when you set a life cycle costing, you give it a description, you can quantify it and you can say actually this rate, and then you would put in the first renewal year. And then what I've seen before, sorry, John. Do you want to put in a good example rather than the unconventional one? No, uh, that's all right. So hang on a moment. So yeah. uh, I've seen this particular setting. Actually, I want to, Set it again at year 47, I think, is what the choice was made. But in actual fact, that's not what it means. The cycle cost means I'm going to repeat it every seven years or every 47 years in this particular. The setting that's on this one is every 47 years. So in other words, it's first going to occur in year seven and then every 47 years after that, obviously gone beyond a uh, 100 year cash flow. The very bottom one I've seen as well where it's, I want this much money in year 40, um, and I'm going to repeat it every year afterwards, which is a little bit daft. So uh, the particular one that I saw was internal painting, and internal painting was set at year seven, and every year afterwards, which uh, I, so it should in actual fact probably more than likely have been every seven years, so it should have been a seven and a seven. Right, hang on. Paul, I think if you question from John, because they can only see one of us at a time, I believe. So, yeah, John. Okay. I think if you um, show a standard setting for life cycle costs, it will make sense of what life cycle costs is about, which yeah. is basically I've spoken to my asset manager. They know the bullet points over the life of the property at which they're making. Um, planned maintenance expenditure on replacing the boiler, doing the windows, doing a kitchen, etc. And they know how much they're spending per item and the quantity. And the first renewal is when they first spend that bullet point of money. And the cycle is how frequently do they repeat that bullet payment. And you have to, the, the trap is the unconventional one that we showed you that people actually put figures in here and then they don't add it up to see how much they are going to be spending on the property maybe that's something we could put in the future in sds that we actually add this up and show you what the total spend is and then the average per year spend maybe we could do that but what we would prefer is is the simple approach 
maybe as a major repairs allowance per unit per annum. Um, what, we're, what we're evidencing to you is one of the many ways of actually putting in planned maintenance into a project or so major repairs as it's always referred to. So well, major repairs, gonna... planned maintenance or life cycle costs, we have many different ways you can actually put in um, life, um, life cycle costs or major repairs or planned maintenance. What we were so showing you was a trap that we've seen a lot of people fall into when they use life cycle costs and then not adding it up and seeing does it match what I think is around about a thousand pounds per unit per annum across the life of the property, which is kind of a typical territory of planned maintenance major repairs. Um, that was the trap we wanted to show you. If you're using life cycle costs, look at them carefully and see um how they're adding up and what they average out as because it's, we've it's, seen yeah it's a little bit more involved than that john because what happens is people use life cycle costs and the trap that they fall into is i'm going to adjust those life cycle costs so they go to their life cycle cost for a one bed flat say for instance and they make an adjustment to it next year they're going to do the same again or in three years time when they research it again the biggest problem we have is the life cycle table still applies to older appraisals. So therefore, those older appraisals are going to be affected by the updated value. Okay. The best thing to do is to clone. So I actually use the year that I inputted them in. And then when I do the 2023 ones, I use the clone button, which effectively copies it because it might be a lot of typing. And then I can then put in the up value. So when you create your unit defaults in the in the library, you would then set that these units are now valid from this year, and we're going to use the 2023 flat cycle costs instead of the 2022. That won't disturb the historical appraisals, because I've seen that many times with the historical ones, all of a sudden, are getting much bigger costs. Uh, we have, guys, we now have uh, a quarter of an hour left. Yeah. Exactly, John, I'm moving you on now. Okay, that's yeah. really good because we, we can, it's great to go into that detail. It's obviously this is being recorded, so you can go back to this. Probably nice to show where actual life cycle costs are actually inputted <laughs> under the administrator button, but we, we've got to move on. Um, so next, the first question in SQL um, was, I think, the affordable rent on loan attribute? Affordable Yes, it, it, this shouldn't take too much time because Paul's already put it in there. Um, the affordable loan um, loan on rent, um, Paul's been able to put an attribute in the property section. And uh, obviously we can give you guidance on doing this. So it's in two places it's able on a per unit basis and, and in the cash flow summary. Yeah. And so he's been able to link it to ProVal. So this is behind the scenes. This is administrator function in SQL. And you're able to link um, anything from coming through from ProVal and make it appear in SQL. Well, most things. Sorry, IT guys. You can link most things. So what, and again, we just quickly want to demonstrate in the property section, Paul, that you've actually linked that attribute and it's occurring. Um, I'm, I'm not. I, I have to put my hand up, John. I destroyed this last night, and I've had to rebuild okay. it. Okay, all right. And I haven't right. actually been able to update those figures yet. Okay. But in in effect, what would happen is when you go to the individual unit in the property section. Um, I, sorry, I've burnt the midnight oil to fix it because I made a cardinal error and restored the wrong database over the wrong place. So, uh, my in my rent data here, you would then get. When it comes through, you then have the figure inside the supportive loan on each individual. So my new IMS report will pick the project one will pick up on the gross one, which is inside the cash flow section. So on IMS, they only want to know for the tenure. So they you would then get the supportable loan on that. Um, it's down here, and then on the individual units. So let's talk about reports a little bit. 
So some of the new reports will come with some of the new data. Let's quickly look at the RMS one as we're talking about that at the moment. Hang on, Paul, yeah. hang on, Paul. Slow down, slow down. Hang on, let's slow down. Let's roll it back a little bit. Hang on a minute. We've got, still got, we've got, we've got time. We don't need to rush through this. Right, so just explain your, your updating SQL with some of more attributes to help the IMS report. But the key yeah. one that you're saying there is the affordable loan, which we were talking about in program. It, it's one of them. There are many okay. of them. So you're showing it in the property section. Let's go back to the property section. Just slow down because it was doing loads of different screens and even though I'm not following it. So oh, the individual that. units, you're linking a new attribute into the property section to yeah. create that affordable loan as a unit level, yeah? As a unit level in the property section. Uh, it would it would normally self-populate yes, because sure. of the profile import. That's fine, so that will go into there, yeah? Um, and then you're summarizing it as a total tenure position in the cash flow attribute. Do you want, do you want, is, is that correct? Yes. Because I can get that from Proval. So on the Proval summary panel, it will tell me the supportable loan for all of the units in that particular tenure. Okay. So I, I can't link the gross one, but I can link the individual one. So each of the individual ones, I can get that data out straight from Proval. Excellent. The gross one, I can just look at the summary panel and just type it in so that I can actually match it up. So on, in the cash flow summary panel, I've got supportable loan and rent would be for the whole tenure. Right. Everyone okay. in the tenure. And I don't need to calculate that because Proval has done it for me. So I could just look at what's in the appraisal and pick out the, uh, the appraisal level for the supportable loan. Okay, great. Stop there. We'll come back to the IMS bit later in reports. Um, the other tip that we wanted to talk, talk about was the quick data in SQL. Um, quick reports, I believe we, we, we call that. So there, yeah. there, there are two of the quick reports can be easily configured. The project okay. one. So if I go to project and I go to quick reports in here, yes. I get to choose on the left hand side different attributes that I want or don't want to export. So okay. I can untick. And if I just recycle this effectively, I could export one column, which is a, the minimum I can do. But where it's really, really useful, and lots of people are using it and finding it useful, is in the property section. So if I go to the quick reports in the property section, I'm literally going to get every single attribute. I want to use the export button because I want to give it to my colleagues. Uh, this is a little bit of a pain because I've got lots of things to tick or untick, so I can untick them all. And pretty much I, if that's easy enough, then i got to go and redo this every time and time and time again. This feature has been there a very long time. It's not used very much, but in actual fact, I could save the tick choices in a label. Wow. And in this case, I've labeled it housing management system, or I could do my IMS output, or I, as you can see that it's a choosing different options. Uh, sales team is a really useful one. So the sales team need to know the addresses. So when you create a new one, all you do is you go to the blank paper and you give it a, a name. Um, employees, what about employees agent? That's a, 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 a always a one that. Okay, so uh, the EA details. So Utilities. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll go there in a moment. So then I would then choose all of these and then I can save that one. Okay. I, I just want to show the process yeah. uh, in quick. But in actual fact, the kind of things that I'm likely to do is utilities. If I do the utilities, I've only got inside the report the utilities that go out i can export this to an excel spreadsheet and i've actually already done this and i can then uh, bring it in from an excel spreadsheet so, so once i sorry so as a simple user okay um what i'm seeing is that i could go to the property section i could put together a standard report on the units that need meter readings i could export that into an excel document and i could send that to my employer's agent and say please fill out the meter readings on these properties and then send it back to me absolutely so let, let's just go through that process so i go to my quick reports i would then choose the utilities output i would then export it i'm just going to save it um 
web team, um, April, whatever it is going to be. That would be for the EA, wouldn't it be? Or the clock of works? Who would, who would I send it to? I'll let's send it to the EA. Let them earn their money. <laughs> EA from us. How's that? Yeah. So if I now go to an Excel spreadsheet, I've saved it out. I want to go and find it. Downloads. There it is there. It's pulled out the data that I already had in those fields. But what I'm expecting is I want the ones back. So my each of my properties have got an MPAN number. So M-P-A-N zero. I'm just going to just make this up as we go. And this one's going to be um, MPAN002. So all the meter readings. So there would be a meter reading uh, and a serial number. So whatever that meeting reading happens to be. Um, one so time. you're you're acting like the employer's agent has got this and is now am, filling yes. out the details. Yeah. So okay. Just to keep us in the loop, just to show, I would obviously not be doing this normally. I yeah. would be actually putting real numbers in. So I'm pretending now to be the EA. And then when I save it, eventually I hope that there's a lot of information now being filled in by the EA. I would now go to import. I need to find the spreadsheet, import from Excel. I need to find the spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet in this case is going to be there. There it is. And I need to update the correct records. Now, this is just a little bit of tech, technical group. I need to update inside SQL. I have a thing called a PRID, which actually stands for property ID. Inside the spreadsheet, I exported the property IDs as part of the export. It's a column that's there. I don't need to alter it. I need to just make sure that it's there. I'm, I, what I'm saying now is for every property inside my spreadsheet that has a property ID, match it to the property ID inside SQL. And these are the fields I want updated. So I just import it. So if we use the manager and just quickly go and look at um, electricity under the utilities, there's those new MPAN numbers that I've just brought back in. Okay, great. All right, let's, let's, let's stop on the showing on that. Um, we'll answer those separately while the postman comes and pulls house, <laughs> by the sounds of it. Um, right, the, the, some of the reports that obviously you've been working on, Paul, the contracts and consultants reports, I think that's quite nice to see. It looks like obviously we're going to run over a bit of time. So if people can stay, then great. If you can't, thank you for attending. We will continue for about five, ten minutes over, probably, just to answer the last part. Um, and keep your questions going. We will answer them if you don't answer them live now. So in, in my cash flow, most of you will be familiar with uh, the bringing transactions in. If part of the transaction import has got, there is a column for supplier ID. So if you have a supplier ID in the transaction and in the global property section, you have a record of those organizations that you do business with. And obviously you have to have a supplier ID as part of the entries that go with that. <coughs> you would then be able to run this kind of report. Now, John and I have actually done this for a customer, and my machine seems to have gone for sleep. The Zoom just actually drives the machine mad. So, sorry, bear with me two secs. I think it's easier just to cancel this out. What, just what version number pull you on? On, on... on SQL, yeah. on, on the latest release. It, it's not SQL, it's Zoom. No, what's the not, Zoom not. just absolutely draws all the resources out of my computer. No, the question, Paul, what version of SQL are you on? I'm on 23, 21, 23. Right, thank you. 23, 1, 20. Released in January. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go back into the project. So inside the transactions, there is a column set aside for supplier ID. Inside the global properties part of the program. If you have your organizations and suppliers in here, we do have a spreadsheet to help you populate this. 
So if you uh, looked at um, uh, some surveys or us, they've got a supplier code. So as long as those are in place, uh, the report will give you this kind of detail. So we actually did this for an organization, John and I. So, so I've got supplier transactions grouped by supplier. So if I click on this, it will go through all of my projects and all of the transactions. So this is about reporting on money that's gone out the door. This particular report has some extra filters in it, but we won't worry about that right now. So what it's telling me here is for first time construction, we've spent 5.1 million pounds with them. And they're involved in a team, Glastron Road, Provel Place, Ridgeview, Sagittin, and this is the amount of money they've spent with each one of them. If there's limitation has been set that they're only allowed to spend X amount of money per project, it would come up in amber. If they exceed all projects uh, limitation, it will come up in red. So it's a really useful. Uh, and obviously very useful at the moment when you have contractors um, going bust and, and being in difficulty. So that's, and so going so, back where so, you- So, so the other report just turns the data around the other way instead of grouping it by by um, organization, we're going to group it by project. So th the data is effectively just looking at it from a different point of view. And if we look at this particular report, I, I'm just going to do the basic one. I can see um, if we go and look at the project that we've got open at the moment is a private place separate tenures on each of the each of the tenures because I've got separate cash flows, I can see how much money I've spent on it. So I've spent so much on clocker work, so much on the development team, so much on my EA, so much on my CDM, so much on my first time construction. I mean, of these are, and I spent so much with Joe Bloggs, the farmer, that would be the land purchase and things like that. If I wanted to see all the detail, all I got to do is say, right, actually, I want to see all the detail. Paul, Paul, question. If you didn't have, um... The question is, how do you put the ID in for the supplier? It's it's a it's a it's a transaction import, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so you have you're 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 seeing it from the point of you're getting the information once you brought it into SQL. Uh, when it's in SQL, how do you get it into SQL? So when you import the transactions, uh, the, the in the transaction listing there is a column for supplier code. Okay. Right, so everyone would normally have a supplier code for their contractors? So um, I don't know any other finance systems that don't record when the transaction is done that in actual fact there's some kind of source for that transaction. A okay. supplier code, a vendor code, it's got lots of different names. So yeah. if you extract that as part of it and put it in the correct column, and the column I think is H, I think, can't remember. So it's on the Excel spreadsheet, that's the download out of your finance system, you can have other specified columns, which one of them you're saying is you've updated it to have a supplier ID code or number, and then that can group them alongside it, yeah? So in the transaction sheet, it is it is column H. Yeah. Column H, you'd put the supplier code in it. Okay, great, thank you. And you have I to make sure that- to... Well, those organizations exist. We need to um, move on very quickly to the IMS report. Yeah, we, got, we said we'll go run over about five, five minutes if that's okay. So the IMS report that's finished at the moment is the one we had lots of discussion, John and I, with people. And what they struggle with is and I've got lots of properties and I want to collate them together ready for the IMS inputting but they've got lots of parameters that might be different from each other. So let's for argument saying, I don't, I haven't counted them. There's probably about 10 or 12 parameters. If one of those parameters is slightly different, I need another entry inside IMS and I find it difficult to collate that information. So in the, the IMS report that I've done first is about collecting the property information. I've configured this for a particular project so I, I, by using a filter, so you would literally filter it on tenure or a particular cash flow or whatever it is you're working on. And the report looks like this. Okay. So I've obviously got fictitious bits and pieces in here. So you you would have a, uh, I have a, a 
attribute for a particular scheme name, which might be different from the one inside Probel, in SQL, I mean. And then I can pick up on the address details. I can pick up on, so I can pick up on all information that's there. So this is a unit of one. It's a two bed flat. It's got new build. It's got the number of bedrooms and the facilities. And then if I scroll down, so this is all in the sequence of the panels that are inside inside IMS. Okay. So my MMC, and then I'm going to go down. This is also a unit of one. It might have a different wheelchair access. I think these are the two wheelchair units. And then I've got uh, one of those. And if we look down in here, I've got three of those. So effectively, it's collated where I've got three project three properties that are identical in all the parameters that I have to look at, I'm going to get a list of three. So this what, is what, what I would say is the blanks that we see are because the attributes haven't been filled out in the property section of SQL. So yeah. it's only as good as the attributes in SQL that have been filled out. But the quick the point so what we've been doing okay and what Paul has been spent a lot of time over the last um, probably about six months we've been working with Sapa Cooper and finding out all the details that that is required is collating the, the right attributes in SQL to get the information you require into a nice report we don't need to go into all the attributes Paul but part, no, I just wanted to show part, while you're talking yeah yep. part of part of the service that we're offering for this report is that we will do this for you okay so you don't have to worry about putting it in the right place um, and the right terminology. Paul is a service that we're going to offer is you buy the report and the service. And so Paul will help you configure this or do this configuration with you. So you, the sort of report is running. It's currently uh, the report is in testing with one or two of our clients. So they're testing it and we will team up um, with probably Sapper Cooper to offer some training if you want training on IMS okay so it's a service they offer so we can kind of buddy up together and offer a kind of nice rounded service of, of helping you get from IMS so I think that is a good time to pause and take breath because that's been a lot of information um and and especially I know we know the systems very well and we can move quickly between one screen and another and it gets quite busy on screen so hopefully you'll get the recording um you'll be able to see that um and download it and then look at it in your own time and please if there's any questions we'll be on this for a couple of minutes afterwards pose your questions we'll look at the questions and then we'll reply back john did you want to say anything yeah i just wanted to demonstrate if you get if you get really um yes you want to change the appearance of sql over on the left hand side, we have a little cog and um, just to amuse yourselves, you can actually have a Valentine's Day setting for SQL or summer <laughs> or springtime. So uh, that's just a little bit at the end. Oh my yeah. God, I, I've, not, I've, not, I've, not, I've not looked at that for years. I remember, I remember when we put that in actually, and that was, that was quite, that's quite interesting. <laughs> and now, you can have springtime. Yeah, we are, we are here. As always, we are here to help. If there's a burning question in the sector you want us to discuss, you want something else to, to go over on of our software products um, on our suite, we are here to help. Uh, we love talking to you. We love helping you. Uh, our My consultancy side are, the are here to do services, workshops, and help you um, understand viability and project monitoring a lot better. So please use us and ask our um, our advice. Now, the next webinar, um, still in discussion at the moment, but the next webinar topic I'm thinking about is house prices and the effect that has on viability, because it's it's really its ugly head again, with the potential of house prices um, dropping with the continued rise in inflation, and then maybe interest rates creeping up a little bit more and the impact that could have um, and that the knock on effect that has in the sector. So viability and the gearing trap is always good. We could mix that with uh, a look at our new land valve that's in the cloud that's just re about to be released. So I'm thinking of that as our topic. If there's a burning topic that people want to kind of um, propose to us or me, then please do. 
the date of that slightly earlier next month because I'm away at the end of the month and then it is half term at the uh, after that. So the 17th of May, Wednesday the 17th of May is our next webinar date that's been proposed. Hope to see everyone there. Thank you for attending. Um, thank you, John, for your hard work. Thank you, Paul, for your detailed um, uh, input on that. And I will say to everybody, have a good day.